Everybody, I think that we should start. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Raquel Cayet. Uh, Raquel um, is a uh, Alzheimer's researcher, um, um, a Tau investigator, but that is not the limit of his expertise and his focus. He uh, is a chemist by training, so he got his PhD from the University of Tübingen with um, honors, and then came to do his postdoc with uh, people from what I would call the generation, generation uh, zero in Alzheimer's disease, Charlie Clay. He also worked with other people in the group at yeah, UC Irvine. Then uh, he became a faculty member at the University of Texas Medical Branch, where he is now a professor. And he has been continuously funded, has over 100 publications, and has contributed seminar observations to the field. So he will talk today about oligomeric strains, uh, tau oligomeric strains, uh, and this is a, t a topic that is very, very hot at this time, and I'm looking forward to his talk. Thank you very much, Veronica, and it's really great pleasure to be here, and uh, I know many of uh, you, and uh, it, it has been a great visit thus far. I enjoyed my uh, meetings very much, and I have to admit, this is my first time on this campus, and it's bigger than I thought it would be. <laughs> so, but, um, so my talk is kind of structured in few parts, so if you uh, have questions, please feel to interrupt me, because I try to condense a lot of work and hypotheses into a uh, few slides of each uh, part. But uh, to start with, I'm going to talk about tau oligomers, and I was <coughs> discussing with Veronica and other colleagues, you don't have to call them oligomers. My name stuck with oligomers for the last 16 years, so I call them oligomers, but you can call them soluble tau, uh, et cetera, high molecular weight tau, et cetera, but I'm going to touch on them. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about immunotherapy targeting tau in general and tau oligomers. And I included this because this is now a main therapeutic venue uh, which is being tested by many drug companies. And then you may have heard about them, tau oligomeric strains, <coughs> or the oligomeric tau strains, which <coughs> will imply that maybe these tau aggregates are prion-like and they propagate, and this was first. Uh, published by Best, who is here with us. And after that, just a few slides. What these uh, concepts uh, propose for us, challenges or opportunities? So this is a recent uh, review about Alzheimer's pathology from Muki and Huang. And it's now a more complicated picture than the oversimplified one, which we all started working on amyloid black and neurofibrate angles. So now we have what we call them amyloid oligomers. And if you bear with me, there is intracellular, there are extracellular, they can bind to synapse, so they're almost all over the place. They're also affiliated not only with neurons, with immunocells, microglia, astrocyte, oligodendrocytes. And this research has been done since the late 90s about a beta or amyloid oligomer. But for tau, we always thought it's intracellular and there is no oligomers. Till I think 2005, we and a couple of others, we started seeing these, what we call them, tau oligomers. And at the beginning was, the challenge was, are they intracellular or extracellular? But it turned out they are both intracellular or extracellular. So the other things which are important for now, that even in Alzheimer's, it's not only a beta and tau. There is other protein aggregates. Regardless if we want to look at them as epiphenomena or they are contributing to the disease. There is alpha synuclein aggregates in Alzheimer's. There is TDB43 aggregates. So the comorbidity which people ignored for a long time in pathology or in autopsy tissue, 
now it's coming back in focus. So you may see a lot of research about different aggregates for genomic sequence. The other thing which is now hot, and I think Veronica working on it and many others, is the contribution of the vascular system uh, in the, to the disease process. And this could be through A beta or through tau because of its importance in clearance, et cetera. So this is also important. Now, I work on oligomers. The only thing I want you to know about oligomers is that they are not fibrillar structures. And the reason for it, fibrils normally, they are well organized and they can back together a lot of material. So if you give me 100 tau molecules, I can back them in one fibrils. But from these 100 molecules, maybe I will make 50 oligomer structure, which are more toxic. So most of the time, we think about fibrils are protective or less toxic. So we first, I, when I was in Charlie's lab, we were the first to detect a beta oligomers. So this, these are the blacks or the red are fibrillar materials and the greens are oligomers. And after that, a lot of research have been shown, have been uh, published showing that oligomers normally they are in the vicinity of these fibrils. Nobody still no, if they are adding to the fibrils, so this is a protective, or they are breaking away from the fibrils and causing more toxicity. We also, when I started my lab, we were the first to show tau oligomers in vivo, and it was, I think we scooped the late Skip Bender by two months, so we published our paper, and then his paper came out, and we both reached the same conclusion that there are these dimer trimers tau in Alzheimer's disease. Now, in general, after maybe 16 years of research, it became acceptable that regardless of which protein we are working on, if it's A beta, if it's alpha synuclein, if it's tau, there is almost similar pathway. So you start with the normal functional protein, regardless of it, if it's alpha helical structure, if it's uh, unstructured, if it's beta sheet, et cetera. If for some reason it misfolds, it will form the, the smallest oligomer, which is the dimer. And after that, they form larger oligomers, protofibrils, et cetera. So here, the fibrils, these are non-toxic, these are functional, and these are the toxic species. So. And these could range from 3 to 50, 2 to 10, depending on the size of the protein. And uh, not all, I'm going to show you at the end, not all oligomers are created equal. There could be different uh, species there. But the bottom line is the gain of toxicity, it looks like it's in this area. And these inclusion, as I said, unless they act as a reservoir for these toxic species, they are almost protective or less toxic. Now, when I was in Charlie's lab, and he was a great mentor, <coughs> he allowed me to work with many proteins. And what we did, we were able to prepare oligomers from almost every protein. You can see A beta, C nuclein, IABB, polyclub, Britain, the brions, and we prepare fibrils. All these were toxic at non-physiological concentration. I'm not claiming they're toxic. So we used micromolar, et cetera. But under the same condition, these were toxic. We were, these were not toxic. The only one is missing from here, if you notice, was tau. And not because I did not try, because I never succeeded when I was in Charlie's lab to get tau oligomers. And so when I was, I always kept this in my mind, and I asked colleagues to provide me with tau protein to prepare it in my own lab. <laughs> when I moved to Texas, I knew what tau does, but I did not work with it before. So for, I think this is here and many people, so basically the dominant hypothesis was is that tau, which is a microtubular associated protein, it gets hyperphosphorylated, it, uh, uh, 
detached from the microtubule, it formed these dangles or fibrillar materials, and these what we call now oligomers, or at least dimers and trimers. So, but the dominant hypothesis was it's hyperphosphorylation which leads to aggregation. For a protein chemist, I'm sorry to say, phosphorylation makes things more soluble. So it never made sense to us. But we could not go against the grain and try to say, oh, it's not phosphorylation. So we chose to work with recombinant tau, which is no post-translation modification. So we tried to ignore the post-translation modification aspect. We said, we just want to focus on the oligomers. So to summarize, our maybe five years of work, you have functional tau, and then you have neurofibrate angles. So if, if this misfold and it goes to fibrils, this means you have verted toxicity. But if it forms these oligomers, and tau oligomers, we and others, we think the smallest toxic species is two to three molecules, and the largest one is eight to 12. If it's more than 12, it may have the shape of an oligomer, but it's not dynamic. It doesn't bind to receptors. It doesn't bind to membranes, so it's less toxic. We think the most toxic, this is their size. And if you notice here, I added it regardless of their both translation and modification. Even others show it's not just post translation modification. You can have uh, proline cis trans isomerization. So regardless of the post translation modification. If we can be good together, two to eight tau units, this means they are toxic. And as I mentioned, you can call them oligomers, you can call them soluble tau aggregates, you can give them whatever term. The only thing we think they are distinct from the fibrils. So if you have antibodies that recognize this, they are different than this one. And uh, <laughs> The size and dynamic are pretty balanced, so you can have uh, large ones which are stable as a conformation, but they are not toxic. More important, when we analyzed, uh, I think, 15 or 30 brain tissues, these oligomers don't represent large portion of tau in the brain. And I think you can see them, you can stain them, you can isolate them. But the reason these have two to three proteins, but a fibril can have up to 100,000 proteins together. So the fibrils back much more material compared to the oligomers. So in the brain, we, and this is the uh, higher limit, 10 to 15% of tau aggregates, not total tau, because tau is abundant. We found them intra and extracellular, but most of our experiment we use what we call them BBS soluble oligomers. So we just homogenize grain, take the BBS soluble fraction. Now, the other important discovery we made, and this was really critical uh, for the recent studies. When we isolated from human brains, we isolated the oligomers and we isolated the fibrils, which are neurofibrillate angles or fibrillar materials. These are from the same human brains. And when we injected them into the hippocampus of wild-type animals, these propagated and caused memory deficit and pathology. These were stationary. Sometimes we saw inflammation around these injections, but most of the time we did not. So, but they did not spread to different areas. Now, one thing I want to, especially for the students, these are fibrils, but if you read the paper, you, you may see fibrils, but the protocol says tonicated fibrils. Tonicated means you take these fibrils, you mechanically syndicate them, so you break them into smaller pieces, then they spread and they cause pathology. So it's just sometimes the protocols or how they are prepared is completely relevant because if you break them into small things, then they spread. Yes?
side? So that's a great question because this is one thing we and others are analyzing. However, for the Michael J. Fox, when they did the nucleon fibers, I think it was 60 nanometers. So I think these oligomers are 60 nanometers. So they can be toxic up to 50 based on the Michael J. Fox independent analysis, okay? But these could be micrometers in size, the fibers. So when you syndicate them, the smaller, the better, because you get more CD. The same, I think, after we published this paper five years or four years after that, also if you add these to uh, brain slices, they affect LTB. And the same thing was confirmed by different groups about the LTB and toxicity, that only the oligomers cause the LTB and memory deficit, not the fibrils. The, ti the trimer, which is the limit, Mark Diamond group showed that the dimer trimer is the smallest, so it's not the monomer. And the one finding which I was proud of, and we tried higher profile journal because we used wild type mice. And at that time, people believed the propagation happens only in mutated tau. Like you have to use the B301S mice, the mice which overexpress mutant tau. But we saw it in the wild type, and you go a few months ago, Cardinelli's group, basically, they did the same experiment, but using different preparation. So they took tau aggregates from different brains, from Alzheimer, DSP, and other tau pathy, and they injected them in non-transgenic mice, and they saw different phenotypes. Yes. That's a great question, but <laughs> so I try to avoid it because it's not my expertise, but my problem is not with the phosphorylation per se. It's the term, hyperphosphorylated. So tau has 70 phosphorylation sites. So by hyperphosphorylated, do we mean four? Do we mean 20? So it's becoming really vague term just to say, how, yes, it is hyperphosphorylated, but there are there could be key so, so when we isolated these, these, this one, we sent them to a guy who's now at NIS, and he did analysis of uh, proteomic analysis. There is some post-translation modification here, but they are much less than these, okay? However, as I mentioned, when we prepare these structures from recombinant tau without phosphorylation, they still have toxicity. But I'm not... Uh, I'm just saying hyperphosphor or phosphorylation could be an event upstream which leads to the aggregation, but it's not the determinant of the toxicity of the structure. But it could be because I think 262 position, it's a mark, kinase, looks like it's disease relevant, but it's upstream. Now, the problem with oligomers, and as I said, most of you I advise not to use the term oligomers, use something different, is that you have to be patient. Working with them, they are dynamic, they're intermediate. So you, you have to optimize your condition. Luckily in my lab, I have dedicated people. You can purify them, you can isolate them, they are homogeneous. Now we are doing cryo-EM studies, structural studies on these preparations. So you can prepare them. However, if you want to use them, you have to use them for, uh, within four or five days at four degrees. Otherwise, you have to freeze them. So you need a little bit more quality control to work with them because they are dynamic. Yes, uh, that's a great question. So. Uh, if you have, the more homogeneous the oligomers, the easier. I'm going to touch, it's a great point. I'm going to touch on it in the second part of my talk. So if you have homogeneous, it's easier to have fibrils because the, the way to think about fibrils that uh, the best fiber is fiber silk. Fiber silk have 100% uh, uniform, so you can put it. So if you have uniform oligomers, you can form better fibrils. But if you have if you have some of them phosphorylated, some of them not phosphorylated, then you may get them stuck in this state. But the point is, 
you have to do your experiments at the same time, proper control, etc. As I said, now we ship them to all over the world. If you put them up to six months at minus 80, they are, they are pretty stable, even longer. The other thing our contribution to the field was, and I, re I developed anti-amyloid antibodies in, when I was in Charlie's lab, but we needed to develop tau oligomer antibodies so we can look at human tissue, mouse tissue. So we prepared full length for our tau. These are the oligomers. We use them as an antigen. We got polyclonal antibodies and we got monoclonal antibodies. They don't recognize functional tau, tau fibers. They don't try recognize oligomers from a beta or synuclein. To date, we know they recognize uh, tau oligomers regardless of the isoform. They recognize tau and tau. So, so what's the epitope? I cannot reveal the exact epitope, but these are non-continuous epitopes. So basically you have two tau proteins, they come together as a dimer, the antibody will recognize a small sequence from molecule number one, another small, they call them non-continuous epitopes. So this is the trick to generate these antibodies. So, and uh, with the Thomas, actually we generated 13 clones because the oligomers can have different non-continuous epitopes. Yes. No, these are far away, at least uh, the ones we found at least two of the epitopes are outside. Yes, that is a good, that's a great question. Now, why non-fibrillar or oligomeric tau? Uh, and we were interested into looking at uh, these structures in animal models, etc., because for years they knew that uh, neurons can survive with neurofibrillate angles, so that's one. And the uh, Brad Hammond group confirmed this into uh, mice uh, using two photon microscopy. So he can uh, have the window, watch the neuron. It has a neurofibril, fib but it's functional. In most of the animal models which are published, the synaptic loss and behavioral deficit, they form before neurofibrillate angles. And uh, so this led to the linking these mysterious soluble tau to uh, behavioral deficit. So we used our antibodies. We looked at uh, Alzheimer brains. As I told you, we quantified them. So this is phospho-231, which is a generic antibody. Normally, it's positive for all of them. Then you start to see tau oligomers. Then the cell die. Then you end up with the ghost tangle. So we think this, aggreg this aggregation or the formation of oligomer plays a role in the cytotoxicity. After that, we distributed the reagents to many people, and they showed many of them. We were the first also to show that there is tau oligomer is supernuclear palsy. We showed this in Parkinson's and dementia with Lewy body. This I'm going to show you more data from. And colleagues in England, they showed also pretty strong tau oligomers in Huntington disease. And this is becoming the theme that if you have a beta or alpha synuclein, you will have amyloid. You will have tau aggregation. Even with polyglutamine in Huntington disease, there is tau. So it looks like tau has a soft spot for other amyloids. So if you have an A beta, then it's easier to aggregate tau. And this is, I'm going to touch, because this is becoming a very important topic in neurodegeneration, <coughs> these interactions between different proteins. Moreover, we were able to quantify these oligomers in CSF uh, and compared uh, Alzheimer's versus mild uh, AD versus control. Now, if you go with the absolute measurements of tau oligomers, the correlation is weak. But if you divide the ratio of oligomers over total tau, then you get clear cut, or at least it was pretty strong correlation. <coughs> and these were, my lab, we measured the oligomers, and all the analyses were done in Sweden, where the collaborators who know these uh, samples and so on. 
Yes. Yes. That's a great question, and the simple answer I'll show you some later. The indication is no, and it looks like the CSF1 are less potent, okay, at least for the spreading. But this is one of my grants is to look at, and I think now Brad Hyman has another project, looking at the different conformation of these aggregates. But the simple answer based on some of the data I'm going to show you is no. They're, they're different at least in some aspects. Now, at that time, this is what was the first paper about oligomeric tau and CSF, and a few months after that, Brad Hyman's group, they published what they call the high molecular weight. So the term high molecular weight, if you look at the paper, they're exactly the oligomers. It's just, if you look, this is high, here the low molecular weight. So basically, they are the same. Uh, species, and they are also isolated from the PBS soluble fraction. So the high molecular weight and oligomers are exchangeable. There's all other terms. So, but, but what we found, they found in CSF, and it was toxic to neurons. Okay? So they isolated these oligomers here from CSF, and they added to primary neuron, and they saw effects on the dendrites and structure. Now, we tried to stretch it and look at the oligomers in the serum. However, uh, there was no significant differences between control versus AD. Now, we published it, but uh, we think most likely because there is some physiological clearance of these aggregates from the brain. This is why the vascular system is important. And uh, I think it... It, th this, this experiment uh, motivated the people in uh, Washington University to now look at tau kinetics in living humans. So now they can radio-label tau, but they have to keep people seven days in the hospital because uh, tau has a, a longer lifetime than it is. Yes. Yeah, so it's it's not, but you know, uh, the only thing we were sk we needed to keep our uh, uh, minds open because there is new reports sh so that the lymphatics are involved in tau clearance. So we don't know, but you're absolutely right. But we go back to the same thing. Uh, Brock and Brock showed that there's even in young children there is, but that's neurofibrate angles. Mm -hmm. So that's where. It's a little bit tricky. So did these kids get brain injury or something, and then they form fibers? So there's still to learn, much to learn. But I completely agree. It could be normal, and there is uh, tau pathology in normal people, and this is a, re a reflection of that. Or it could be that there is a systematic or physiological clearance. This means, this is why I said I'm excited about Washington University, because <laughs> Longitudinally, they are following the levels in serum. All right, so I'm going to now, I hope I convinced you about tau oligomers, but doesn't mean people or companies are just targeting tau oligomers. There's a lot of therapeutic approaches prior to targeting tau. Microtubular stabilizers, they failed in clinical trials. There is tau assembly inhibitors. Most of them failed. The most prominent one is methylene blue. Upstream to prevent uh, post-transition modification, most of them failed. I think now people are looking at acetylation, so they are trying to target HDAC, et cetera. So there's still, but as I said, these are a little bit upstream. So once you form these tau aggregates, they seed on themselves. So that's where becomes independent of the upstream factor. There is also exciting work show, uh, about protosome and mitochondrial enhancers, uh, protease inhibitors. So there's a lot of them. But the most, I think, exciting approach is 
tau immunotherapy. And I think now every pharmaceutical company has at least one tau program because of the failures with the A-beta immunotherapy. Doesn't mean it's going to work, but I think maybe it has a better chance than the A-beta. <coughs> so it's the most promising approach for tau. Now, preclinical studies, uh, I mean, they may look many, but you're talking about almost 60 studies compared to a few thousands for a beta, so we still have a long way to go. But I want you to ignore our studies and Peter Davis' studies. Most of the immunotherapy, they target either phosphatau or neurofibrotangles. So at least this is the common target. So Peter Davis is here, and us here, we target misfolded tau or conformational tau. Everything else is either N-terminal or phosphatau. And we think it's not the good target because now this is just not to go into the details, but luckily many of the companies now they have a tau program. So one or more tau programs. So the, it's, there, is, there is progress may, being made. And Pfizer, AbbVie actually went to human. So there is at least six or seven phase one and two, and there is one phase three clinical trial. So now when, when it comes to tau, please just pay attention. Sometimes they test their drugs in Alzheimer's. Other times they test it in PSP. So because they think your tau by maybe it's easier to treat. So. Uh, and there is a nice review by Inner Surgeon, recent review, which goes into the details of all these clinical trials. The last thing, I think, for clinical trials, and this is pretty important study, but unfortunately, it's just one patient with mild AD. So Ionis, they are doing antisense oligonucleotide. So this one, they deliver it once a month for six months uh, through the spinal cord. Or the, the issue which we still don't have uh, reliable biomarker, CSF4 blood biomarker, we're trying to do the Sonoma platform. To ha for biomarkers, it's not enough my paper or somebody's paper. You need something which is automated and independently verified. But we're still working on these things. As I said, there's only one phase three clinical trial for tau. A beta, I think, more than 203 clinical trials phase three, and all of them failed. So there's still a long way to go. I hope we don't fail, or they don't fail, but there's progress. Now, for immunotherapy, as best mentioned, is tau in the CSF the same as in the brain? The answer most likely it's not, but at the end I'm going to show you there's different tau aggregates. So it's important when you develop antibodies to know the target, the epitope, specificity versus affinity. I mean, sometimes, especially for amyloid, if you have a neurofibrate tangled, leave it alone. Why you need to target it? First of all, in order to target neurofibrate tangle, because it has so much material, you need large amount of antibodies. You may need 100 milligrams or 200 milligrams. Target only the soluble one, the selective, target selectively. So this is really important, affinity versus specificity. Axis and target engagement. <coughs> so the first studies with tau, and it's binary study, but they tried to push it, to push the antibody to get inside the cell. The rationale behind it, it's intracellular tau. And they went all out to confirm that the antibody gets inside. Then we and others show, no, 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 you can get beneficial effect without needing the antibody to get inside the cell. So these are really important things. Mechanism of action. The, the first mechanism was uh, proposed is phagocytosis. The antibody binds, the FC receptor is there, it gets phagocytosis. Now we and others, we know we don't need phagocytosis. You can clear it by the peripheral mechanism. Benefit side effects, so this is also important. So our studies were, can we specifically target oligomeric tau? I think some of you may show this data. 
So just to take you back to our antibodies, we chose one of the Toma clones. And if you can uh, bear with me, Bicar tau oligomers, monomeric tau is here, you don't see it. It doesn't recognize C nucleon or A beta. You can do multiple structures. So this is from Alzheimer brain. This is the oligomeric tau. Tau monomers with the six isoforms are here. You can detect them with a the generic antibody. So we know that it is specific for oligomers, and it doesn't recognize uh, monomeric tau or other. But can it target, specifically target tau oligomers in mouse models? And for this one, actually, we published a few studies. This is just a summary. This antibody worked in different mouse models. Worked in B31L, H-tau, Thai, uh, tau model. And it worked uh, with different uh, routes. We can do ICV. Our main thing, we do intravenous uh, injection, tail uh, in the tail. We did also IB injection. It did not work in the TG4510. Uh, and now we know this mouse has more complication than just tau, but when we did the experiment, we really did not know. So luckily, the reviewers liked it, although it's a failed study, but they published it. But it was at that time, it did not work. So what can we do? And we have one study in the Parkinson's disease model. We hope it will be published this month. But, so our first study was, and this is really important because it convinced us that you can target only the oligomers without the neurofibrillar tangent. So these are the uh, mouse model overexpressed mutant tau, the B301L uh, uh, mutant. And this mouse model gave severe mainly motor phenotypes and uh, memory, but it's mainly motor phenotypes. And at eight months, it has full-blown pathology and phenotypes. And we did two paradigms, one ICV, but I'm going to show you the IV. And one thing about the dosing, so we tried to outsmart ourselves. We said other studies, they use 200 microgram of antibody. If the oligomers are 10%, let's cut the dose. So we always, we also use low dose of antibodies, maybe 10 times less than what was published. And these are the animals which receive our antibody or tau oligomers, so there's no change in the neurofibrillar tangles compared to the IgG. No significance. You can do gala silver staining, you can, you can do AP8, et cetera. So we did not touch the tangles. But when you look at the biochemistry, we removed these oligomers, okay? The monomer, sometimes there's slight changes, but overall, when you correlate to actin, there were no changes. And so that was all perfect. We did not have issues with the reviewers, but we got stuck at the mechanism of action. So when we did our experiment, the postdoc always measured the levels in the blood. And after we administer the antibody, within an hour, you see spike of tau aggregates in the blood. And we put this data in the paper, and the reviewer said, no, that's not happening, et cetera, blah, blah. We repeated the experiment, but that was a very sticking point. Eventually, we had to change to another journal, and it was published. And uh, this is basically the mechanism. You inject minor, small amounts 2% of the antibody gets into the brain, and the rest works via peripheral uh, depletion of soluble tau, okay? These neurofibrillate angles, they don't change. They are still there. It's just you have to sequester these. Also, when we added the antibody to primary cultures, it did not get internalized. So all the action took extracellularly. They, there was no evidence of antibody internalization or microglia activation. I'm showing you this, although it's published, because moving forward five years from when we published it, this is David Holzman group. So they use, this is important because in this study, they have two experiments. One they did in mice, 
So they injected similar to what we did. They injected their own antibody in the B3A1S mice, and they saw spike in tau in the serum. They said, that's really exciting. So we have the humanized the antibody. Let's try it in humans. So when they administer it to supernutrial varsity patients, they saw the same phenomenon. So even in humans, if you give small amounts intravenously, you can see spike of tau, and it's me you can measure it. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, it's because it's because the antibodies. I mean, some some tau antibodies. If you use phospho tau antibody targeting, you can clear the neurofibrillary tangles. Okay, so so I think it's all about the abacus. So the ones which were more effective in clearing the plaques were antibodies. So so that's one thing. This is why I put the specification. So up uh, we had uh, five failed. A beta clinical trials. And then a guy in uh, Australia took these antibodies which were used and co crystallized them with A beta. It turns out the one from Pfizer, the one from this company, they all recognize the N terminal part of A beta. So the affinity sometimes is misleading because it recognizes what's exposed. And in the plaques, if you use an N terminal antibody, you can clean them. You can remove them regardless where they are. The same for uh, <coughs> the tau antibodies. Uh, I forgot who's the lab. They use an N-terminal antibody. They can take care of the black. So, so it depends on what you want to target. But it was already, there is a lot of tau outside the cell. So there is an equilibrium between these structures. So, so, only soluble intracellular. The insoluble intracellular was not reduced. So I did not show the data, but we, even when you remove it, there is a significant reduction in membrane tau, cytosolic tau, but all soluble ones not the insoluble. So, because in tau, it's a little bit complicated. You can do sarcosyl soluble, sarcosyl insoluble. So you can uh, differentiate it into few pools. Some of the pools, they, they change, okay? So, now, when it comes to Alzheimer's, many people think maybe a beta because of the mutation cause Alzheimer's is upstream of tau or at the same time. But definitely, there is some interaction between A beta and tau. I mean, a lot of elegant work from Leonard Mookie, et cetera. They put spin kinases, PRBC. So there's a lot of signaling. But our hypothesis is that there is also what we call direct interaction between the aggregates, OK? The reason for it, if you take a beta and you add it to tau, it aggregates much faster. So we are focusing on the direct, but absolutely there are indirect interactions. <laughs> and uh, so in order to prove this, we uh, went and said, what if we target? So let me just say one thing else. In most amyloid mouse model, there is no neurofibrate angle. Okay, there is only some phosphorylated tau at late, at when they are really old. And there are few studies. But if you have a BD mouse model, you don't see neurofibrate angles, okay? However, we saw in other amyloid models, there is some soluble aggregate. So we said, okay, do these animals, or though they are ABD animals, do they have soluble tau or tau oligomers? And the, the Simple answer is yes, they do. And actually, these are well characterized. The A beta oligomers, they start around six months. After seven months, six and a half months, you start to see tau oligomers. You don't see neurofibrillary tangles. So 
Diana said, I'm going to immunize these animals. They are APD animals. I'm going to immunize them with tau oligomer antibodies, trying to prove that tau aggregation is mediating a beta toxicity. It was a long shot, but the results were imp impressive, and after a single injection, she was able to show that the animals improved, but what was more interesting, there is reduction in tau oligomer, but this was not the biggest surprise. The biggest surprise was there is an increase in black deposition. Also, there is reduction of a beta oligomer. And this was pretty shocking, and I said, you submitted on your own. I mean, there is improvement. I was really, at that time, there was no bridge. I know blacks are not toxic, but to increase them, that was pretty. We submitted to Gen Neuroscience, and it was accepted like within two weeks. I mean, they asked us for a few controls. I said, wow, there's, you must have some fans there. Like, <coughs> and it was pretty uh, neat. And at that time, still when we presented it, people said, okay, that's uh, like this is not mechanistic, etc." But then grou another group repeated, they immunized also with the triple transgenic, you remove tau, you affect a beta. So there's at least three, four groups showing that targeting tau has some effects on a beta, okay? In our case, this is what happened. You, this is the, what we published, and people were laughing at it. But we said, okay, you have a beta and tau oligomers. They stabilize each other. You remove tau oligomers, a beta oligomers, because there's so much of them. This is a beta overexpressing. They form black. So it was straightforward, and uh, we published it. Then after that, like a couple of years after that, it became obvious that there is uh, some others looking at this. So in this paper, inhibition of A-beta black formation by alpha nuclei. So uh, uh, Meyer Lehman group, she, she's the first one to publish the book Corn Black. So she's an expert in in vivo imaging. So if she overexpress alpha synuclein with A-beta, she doesn't see blacks, but the animals do worse on the viral test. So this supports that for some reason, when you have both a beta and synuclein, a beta doesn't go to the black, but it stays in its toxic form. So this supports at least this interaction between these aggregates and increased toxicity. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is another combination, not just tau a beta, synuclein a beta. But I think the biggest one came a few months ago from Ben Walzin's group. So Ben Walzin group, Imagine our experiment, but instead of uh, a beta, it's the TIA, RNA binding protein. So in this paper, what he shows that if you have TIA, which forms aggregates and it's involved in stress granules, and you have tau, TIA is stabilizing tau in its toxic conformation, which he himself, the integrate things to here, label them as oligomers. So TIA stabilized tau oligomers. This is their toxicity. If you reduce or move TIA, then tau forms the fibrils, and they show it pretty clearly, and then you don't have toxicity. So now it becomes important that there are these toxic interactions between these proteins, and they're not limited on tau and A beta. One great uh, project going on the lab is we think the interaction between tau and synuclein. And we think this, is, this plays a role in Parkinson's disease, at least late stages, and dementia with Lewy body. As I mentioned, there is pretty well established indirect interaction between tau and synuclein, especially the LARC2, pink one, Parkin. So there is these indirect interactions. But also, we think there is the interaction between synuclein, tau, similar to a beta and tau, there's synuclein, tau. And, uh, and this has been very uh, 
rewarding project for us because first we show that even in humans, and this is published last year, they can co-localize and they interact. This is a, there's so many experiments in this paper, but the bottom line is that they can physically interact with each other and cause substitution. And this is in both humans and mouse models. And last week we had a paper, I think it's still in, uh, it's online, a paper in biological psychiatry. What we demonstrated is that sinuclein in vitro and in vivo can induce a new strain of tau oligomers or tau aggregates. So the differences are really striking. So if you have tau oligomers, or tau oligomers plus a little bit of sinuclein to induce it, they become more potent and more toxic. And uh, we think, similar to what I showed you before, if you have tau oligomers, they are here with sinuclein, they stayed in more toxic form. If you have them alone, their lifespan is shorter, they form larger aggregates. And we tested them in cells, they are more toxic, and they affect the synapses in primary culture. And most importantly, if you inject them into animals, these, the sinuclein-induced tau aggregates are more toxic than this one. They're both bad, but if you compare them side by side, this is worse and it causes more phenotype. <coughs> and as I said, uh, we did a lot of experiments here, and uh, one important experiment, I think, I'm just gonna mention it to you, is that does sinuclein needs tau to mediate its toxicity? At least from our animal experiment, it looks like yes. So this is a lot of work, but it's easy to summarize. So you have sinuclein oligomers, sinuclein fibrils, and brain-derived sinuclein oligomers. So these were isolated from Lewy body dementia or Parkinson's brain. So if you ask me blindly, who, which is one is more toxic, it's always the brain-derived material. It's more toxic than the recombinant material. That's for sure. Then you compare this and this, the oligomers are more toxic than the fibrils. So this is the most toxic, this is second, this is third. If you take these three and inject them into three animal models, wild type, tau knockout, tau overexpressing, only in wild type and tau overexpressing animals, they are toxic. But they, these, these, even this one, the most potent, they were not toxic in the tau knockout. As I said, this paper is online now, it's in biological psychiatry, but uh, as I said, this is not just about our work. This is becoming now a movement about understanding the toxic interaction between different proteins. And it looks like there is additive uh, toxicity. Now I think I'm just going to touch on the last part, maybe a few slides about maybe you heard from this, etc., or other speakers, the strains. So prion-like fashion, and this is, tau is the most advanced one, but tau and sinuclein have been shown to, ag to propagate in a prion-like fashion. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I think I understand. So uh, these tau knockouts, so it depends when you knock out tau. So if you knock it in a developmental stage, there is compensation. So the animals are viable. Now, 
uh, Robinson and I think Salvo, they're developing uh, foundational knockout. So I think knocking it in adults could be problem, okay? But I don't know yet. But, uh, but for us, we were all, because we are Tao-centered right now, we thought it's just Tao. But then we found these other proteins. So it's not just tau and a beta tau nucleus. There could be a network. I think, I think people, if you want to study it mechanistically, there is proteostasis problem. You know what I mean? You may start with the one which is more prone to aggregation, but after that, you may even lose functional proteins. So uh, my lab focuses on gain of toxicity, but by no means there is no loss of function in these uh, processes, okay? So uh, I, there is calcium signaling, there's a lot of uh, homeostasis, mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, protosomal dysfunction, so uh, nuclear uh, transport. So there's a lot of gain of toxicity and loss of function in these processes. But we think if you can target these protein aggregates, multiple of them, you may at least uh, slow down the progression and maybe give the cell chance to recover. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think what uh, I want to say about brion strains, n by no way I'm advocating tau as a brion or infectious. We don't do this. It's just like for us a strain is about propagation, not infectivity. So it's really important to keep <coughs> in mind that we're not saying infectious. We're saying it propagates, I don't know. I mean, maybe in the future they will prove it, but for us, it's all about propagation and spreading. So the only things I want to focus on is that <coughs> multiple strain can exist in different brain region or the same region. And this is true for brains. So <coughs> this is important because I'm gonna show you that sometimes it's not all one strain. Like if you have two strains in brains, one most of the time dominate the other but doesn't mean that they don't have a truce and they can stay each one there. So, but, but most of the time there is the domination and the domination is important because if, if each strain form is gonna stay there, we end up with thousands and thousands of strains. So the domination is positive too. So the bottom line in the brium field, it's standard, you can have uh, distinguished strains by incubation barrier, neuropathology conformation, and the standard phase, the proteinase gate digester. So you prepare prion under different condition or you isolate it from uh, different uh, subtypes or mutations. If you uh, induce it in wild type, mouse or hamster, each strain should give you different phenotype, different biochemical uh, profile after PK digestion, and to call it a strain, I think the minimum you have to do it twice. You cannot just take it and induce it in one generation. It has to be repeated. So you have to take it from this one and induce it in the next generation. <coughs> and Mark Diamond's uh, group, now he's at Southwestern Virginia Lee, they showed clearly that for the fibrillar, there are different conformation. And it's not uh, rocket science with the fibrils because you can look under, look under the EM and you can see different fibrils. So, but the beauty of their work is that they took these fibrils and they introduced them into animals. They did a lot of in vivo studies and analysis and they show it looks like they are distinct strains. They propagate, as I said, the, the word is propagate. <coughs> now, it's what I, advocated for the last 50 minutes that I don't care about fibers, I care only about oligomers, which means I have to look at oligomeric strain. And this is true, so we really don't care about fibers. We want to look at the toxic uh, oligomeric strain. Luckily, I always lean back on my expertise with a beta. So strange phenomena for me was not new, because even in 2010, <coughs> I showed that there is a beta oligomeric strain. And after that, we continued, collaborated with others. So strains is not a new phenomenon for me, but Tau strain is what's new. And also, uh, <coughs> I think
think this is just few months ago, materials just are actually uh, take it to the next level. Now it's not just grains, he calls them clouds. So there's all these combinations like, so I think the phenomena is real, it's just can we target it, can we look at it objectively and see which one is more important than the other. And you can form a lot of oligomers. Now, this is, this is the, we have a couple of uh, full protocols and we just call how to, to characterize the brain. So basically, you can take a brain tissue or CSF, isolate, <coughs> you can isolate the fibers by uh, sarcosyl fractionation. We isolate the oligomers by using <coughs> mainly affinity columns or Tuckroy fraction. You can isolate the monomer. If you have strains, then you subject them to what we call the first step. It's the biophysical, biochemical analysis. So different strains will give you, the main one is proteinase k digestion, but there's a host of biophysics you can do. Then you say, okay, it looks like I have a strain. Can I do immunological characterization? Luckily for tau, there is antibodies that bind to the N terminal, T terminal, we have conformation. So there's a lot of antibodies. Finally, which is really cool, you can take tau over expression cells and add these strains to the cells and see how they give like different morphology. And this is what Mark Diamond basically and the cells you guys developed, like these are cells which are important to study this experiment. And if you are convinced from these pre in vitro uh, paradigms, you can say, okay, now I can use animal and introduce them in animal and so, for us, and uh, we said, let's focus on the immunological characterization. I told you when we developed SOMA, we, we used only one, this one, because it's an IgG2A. But when we generated these antibodies, we generated 13 of them. So this is SOMA1, SOMA2, SOMA3, SOMA4. This is a generic antibody, this is antagonist. So when we used from AB versus CD versus CSP versus AB CSF. So it looks like the reactivity is different. So this is why we had hints that based on the antibody reactivity, and you have to use much more, like with both dot plot, ELISA, et cetera, that at least what they display <coughs> is different between, for example, the BSP versus the AD. So this is reactive, not reactive. So this was the first hint. I think I'm missing something. I don't want to miss something. All right, but uh, unfortunately, the, the most important thing. So, but when you take these and you subject them to proteinase K, K digestion, they also give you different patterns. So, we know from multiple analyses that these are different strains, at least the AD, BD, BSP. No, these are complete. So these are, so we, we took, first of all, we took the seed Alzheimer brain cortex, and then we screened them, and we found four of them, especially the late stage, they have the same tau oligo. So we isolated from three to four brains of Alzheimer, three to four BLB. Doesn't mean every Alzheimer brain has the same. So we had to screen. Sometimes they are different. Yes. And not only conformation, they give us a different PK digestion profile. I'm sorry, there is a slide I will show to you. But you can show that these two Alzheimer brains, if you subject them to BK digestion, they give you the exact pattern. Yeah. So, but this is the paradigm. But instead of what everybody in the field did, so everybody isolated these, and they injected them into the brain directly. So our idea was, and instead of injecting to the brain, you may cause injury, you may cause inflammation. What if we inject them directly into the retina and let them, 
because it's part of the nervous system and let them spread. So this is the novelty of, I think, of the project is we used oligomers and we did not inject into the brain as we re-injected into the retina. We sacrifice, we isolate again from the second generation, we do this work. So this is under review. But what was surprising is that you inject three different families in the same mouse model under the same condition, but when you do stereology, the pathology is different. So doesn't mean, and this is important, I'm gonna just wrap it up here. It's important that, first of all, here they cause different phenotypes. So the AD, this is immobility versus mobility versus novel object versus Vertarat versus the Y-mate. So each strain or each aggregate induce different phenotypes than the other. Doesn't mean it replicated the disease by any means, but we can confirm that the phenotypes were different, okay? So I think this is the only thing. I'm not saying this is, this represented Alzheimer's disease. Now, if we do stereology and quantification, also it depends which pathology. So you can look at oligomers or you can lo look at neurofibrillary tangles. And the pathologies were different depending on what you inject. And this is, this is the stereology uh, data. And what it showed is that if you look at the oligomers, there is the AD induced more in the CA1 versus PSP. The dendrite gyrus, the AD was more. But in the cerebellum, the BSP has much more. So, and this is stereology, as I said. BSP has more in the superior clitoris. So there is more, and these are the fibrillar ones. This is the ATA. And this data, just a flavor of what's in the paper. What we want to say is that we are not claiming or we cannot claim that what you inject did not reach the area. But maybe some brain regions can handle these oligomer, bag them into fibrils, or make them less toxic. So there is the spreading aspect, and then if they reach this region, are they toxic in that region, or they can be encountered by immune cells, etc. So it's pretty neat experiment. <coughs> Now, this is to summarize it. We know that they induce distinct phenotypes. We know they are different in the BK digestion. And the, the grant we got for this project, the big grant, is to try to inject now the opposite. Inject into the brain and try to do OCT in the eye because OCT now has high resolution. Mm -hmm. And you can pick inflammation in the eye, you can pick amyloid pathology, you can pick tau pathology. So we want to see if we accelerate the pathology here, can we detect it in the OCT, uh, in the eye, in the retina. The only issue we need to be careful with is that turns out many of our tau animals were the retina is detached, so we needed to cross it a different background in order to get better uh, results. Now, the strain implication is not only about <coughs> phenotypes or toxicity. What we think is that depending on what oligomers you have, the spreading mechanisms may be different. So for Alzheimer-derived brain oligomers, it looks like it's clathrin-mediated endocytosis, but when we use Lewy body dementia or Parkinson, it looks like there is more cabioli-mediated, different mechanisms. So this is preliminary data, it's not under review or something, but what I want to say is that understanding what species we are working on may affect the mechanistic or how they affect the synapse, they affect the neuron, cellular specificity, region specificity. <laughs> I think there's a lot for us to learn. So what I think, or at least our lab's hypothesis is that there are upstream factors. Uh, I mean, there is alternative splicing, post-primary sophistication, chaperone, mutation, truncation, etc. My lab is focused only on these other amyloids, and all these factors, they lead to the formation of soluble and insoluble strains. Our lab focused only on the soluble ones, 
and we work on their characterization, detection, quantification, and then therapeutic approach. Now, by no means we or anybody, young researchers, should only focus on neurons. The immune system, the astrocytes, the glia, they contribute to the spreading, and it could be just exocytosis, it could be mediated by exosomes, by a lot of mechanism, uh, uh, presynaptic or postsynaptic <laughs> spreading. So it could be what they describe it, network spreading, but also if you get a brain injury, for example, most likely <coughs> you will also have local spreading. So, so there is the local spreading and there is the network spreading now, downstream, it got interesting. We were the first to show tau in vascular dysfunction. We published this with Veronica, and now it's a big thing, like tau is implicated in vascular dysfunction. Inflammation, photosomal dysfunction, external transport, synaptic dysfunction, but it's also important for us to remember that also these feed back into the aggregation, and maybe they lead to the formation of Now, as I said, there is still a lot of key, key questions which are not answered, but there is progress by other labs. So now we know the atomic structure of Alzheimer's brain-derived NSPs, the biophysical, strain stability and propagation, uh, the key structure elements. So as I said, I may showed you three, four strains, but these strains, I focus on the differences, but also some uh, structural biologists, they may find key elements, and then we can target all three with one antibody or one therapeutic approach. What also we are excited about is the dominant strain. So if you can, if you take all these strains and put them together, see which one is the one you have to target, this can make our life easier. There could be transient strains, some maybe at different stage of the disease, there will be different structures. So there's a lot of protective ones. I think we added here because the prion seals, they discovered that one mutation in the prion protein can produce prion species which can overwhelm the toxic one. As I said, there's a lot of questions, uh, and we work on a lot of approaches, but I think the immunotherapy is the most interesting. Uh, we're trying to develop biomarkers for vector imaging and assays for um, uh, TSF and plus. As the final uh, slide, and this is for sure my final slide, we just have, we just published an opinion. We think <coughs> in Alzheimer's or in these diseases, there is at least two stages. There is the tau independent, and the tau dependent. So if you look at a beta, maybe at the early stages, after that it becomes all dependent on tau. And these are the ones which are confirmed. But most likely we need to target a beta tau, and <coughs> if the data holds up, we may have to target other protein experts like Sinuclein and PDD42. <coughs> I thank you for your attention now without uh, Working with oligomers is really hard, but I think this is the third generation of oligomer specialists. They are having fun because the experiments are working. But uh, I think the people who struggled with me the most are Julia Gerson, now she's in Michigan, uh, Deanna and uh, Christian, now they have their own lab. And I think these were, the four of them were the pioneers and uh, contributed to everything I showed you today. I mean, uh, uh, recently, we have a lot of funding from IM NIH, but uh, the Mitchell Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases stuck with us, although we were looking at new things, the Seeley Foundation, the Gilson Foundation, and uh, nothing can be done without collaboration locally. We collaborate with many labs, but also nationally and internationally. I really think this is just one-third of the list. but. And finally, uh, these people will be happy to provide any reagents to any lab. They don't ask me. We can just do.
you can charge. You get a legal mark, antibodies, whatever you need to supply them. You just have to pay for the shipping. Thank you very much for your attention. I think that's a great question because if you ask me, I think I have some oligomers somewhere. Maybe I need a second head or I need some uh, like factors to the second head or the third head. I think that's, that's, that's absolutely true. Now, the kinetic we showed in vitro, we can reproduce it in vitro by using dose dependence. So, what I'm trying to say is that there is a threshold. Every one of us may be able to handle picogram of oligomers because of uh, extracellular release of tau, stress tau, etc. But if the threshold is more, then the system gets overwhelmed. Now, it's not going to be one set. It's going to take some time. The protosome fails. Maybe the autophagy will fail. Okay? So... There is multiple layer of protection. <coughs> However, if I want to repeat the kinetic, we do dose dependent. In prion, we do, we do dose dependent. We can inject in one region three different concentrations, and the pathology will correlate with the amount of protection. So, so as I said, there is two factors here. One is the enucleus, which is the seed, and the other is the host. And what we are trying now to understand is the effect of the host. So my lab now, we stopped doing immunotherapy in six months or three months old. Now we're using animals which are 24 months old. We still use the same genetic background, but in the future, people want to use mice with diverse genetic background. So all these experiments are critical, and I think once they are done, they will give us a better answer about which one, who will have five years different kinetic versus <laughs> 10 years different kinetic? Yeah. Yeah. First of all, I would like to ask, in your stress test, when you saw the, the numbers you used, uh, do you think there will be a kind of a depression point where you might uh, reject them and give them back to the nursery when you have already solved the the simple answer is yes, but let me before that say something as a disclosure. I don't believe a single biomarker is going to be detected. I think we need tau. We need something which can measure the inflammation in the brain, something which can reflect uh, the uh, microtubule stabilization. So I think to be precise in diagnostics, you need at least five to six multiple markers. That's microRNAs, exosomes. So we need a multiple to get into the system. Now, having said that, the problem with CSF is dominated by the people in Sweden and Scandinavia because they have larger families. And these people are a little bit aggressive, so they just do one measure. Now it's NFL, uh, neurofilament protein. So they do one or two, and they just – so they don't – follow the, what I call a transient train. So, however, some people did really beautiful analysis in transgenic animals, and they look at the dimer versus the fibril versus the monomer, and they can see there is transient train. Like, there is, it's not always going up. And for us, as I mentioned, <coughs> if you look at the absolute measurement, the correlation were almost all over the place. I mean, there is a trend, but it was. But when you do the ratio of tau oligomers over total tau, it was zero. I mean, and this is their analysis. So, I think, and maybe because if you have more uh, tau, you may have more 
understand a bit more. Let me let that. So the ratio was much better. So <coughs> the screen is shaking. But do I believe the oligomers alone or is there the oligomers <coughs> there? No, it has to be multiple because when you get the disease, there's a lot of things. I can answer the third part because this is where. So what we notice is that in the young mice, it's easier for us. So I told you we have 13 antibodies. We took four of them, which we produce in large quantities. And if we use three-month-old mice, we can reverse the, all the phenotypes in these younger mice. In the aged mice, we could not reverse the old phenotypes. Sometimes we need higher dose to reverse one phenotype. Sometimes we did not affect other phenotypes. So the therapeutic efficacy was much less in the age mice. Now we are doing the biochemical or ecological analysis of these animals, but one thing I'm for, for sure is shown that it's hard to reverse the phenotypes in age mice. And this is, as I said, without taking multiple genetic background, etc. It's just like eight animals, one in four, 18 months in some animals, and it's much challenging to reverse it. And I was surprised that there wasn't a lot of study doing therapeutics on aged uh, animals. I mean, all of our cow studies where we start a three month, six month, eight month, that's pretty old, but <laughs> I think there were six months. I think there were six months. Yeah, I think I think a lot. I, I mean, I did not show, but we we tried to. So I think. If you tell me, right, is you have, you claim you, there is 10 uh, different protein aggregates. One is tau, one J beta. And you have only choose to target two of them. Not, you cannot target the 10 like what you want. I would choose the larger one because normally it's easier to target. And I would choose the one with the slowest genetic. So, for example, I will not go after a beta or IABB because, first of all, if you have it interacting with tau, removing tau, which is larger compared to that one, is much easier. And also a beta. So, for example, without offending the beta people here, but I don't think there are many of them, they always focus on a beta 42. But in reality, a beta 40 is much more toxic. They base their assumption based on the aggregation profile. If you take a beta 32, a beta 40, you put them next to each other, a beta 42 is already fibrous. But if you spin it down, it's less toxic than a beta 40. So, so this is how sometimes. So the RNA, I showed Thea, but we are working on another one. So I think RNA binding proteins are really critical, but also uh, they may be in important also at the early stages because now people are looking at different uh, nuclear tau or so so uh, so it's it's we're trying now it took maybe 10 years just to go extracellular versus intracellular but the extracellular came from somewhere where it started it started in the cytosol or it started in the late endosome so all these I told you the nucleon tau interaction. But where did it happen? Does it happen in the late endosome? Does it happen? W so th in order for them to physically interact, it must have happened somewhere. Yes. 
Yeah, so uh, as I said, I'm proud to work on oligomers because the building block for both the fibrils and the annular is the oligomer. So I can, I, we brought this case. If you take an oligomer, you tell me, Rakis, I want it to form an annular. You basically, you use a hydrophobic environment. You can uh, add lipids, you can add hexane. So, so it's, if we go back to uh, Dr. Fad's question. There are multiple factors and that affect the strain. The only thing which we should focus on is the dominant strain. And if I know that it is strain A, it's really much easier to go upstream and say for specificity that this phosphorylation, this methylation, give me strain A. But the problem we're having now is we have multiple oligomers and we want to have one <coughs> upstream factor. It's not going to happen. So you have, so this is why I think many of us are excited about the structural studies. Because if you can, for sure, establish the atomic structure of two strains, then you can track them upstream. You can go upstream, see what caused this strain to form. But looking at just general things is really hard. 